welcome, welcome everyone to our uh, last distinguished lecture series for this calendar year. Uh, and we have a, a very special guest uh, uh, today. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, there is one more talk in, in our other series, which is aimed at our uh, internal faculty speaking to the AI community, the expeditions in experiential AI. And next week, uh, oh, sorry, on, on uh, the first week of December, we will have as our speaker, uh, Christo Wilson, who will be talking to us about uh, a lot of the work he's been doing with algorithmic audits and uh, some of the very exciting stuff that got covered also in the MIT Tech Review uh, on, on the recent audits uh, in the hiring space. Um, with that said, let me turn our attention uh, to today's talk, uh, which should be uh, a very exciting and, and different talk uh, by Professor uh, Mike Jordan uh, from U University of California at Berkeley. He's the Feng Cheng Distinguished Professor in the departments of electrical engineering and computer science and the department of statistics. Uh, Mike has done some amazing works stemming all the way from uh, after his PhD at UCSD in, in, in control theory, all the way to uh, machine learning, uh, statistical pattern recognition, pattern recognition in general. Uh, I met him first when he was uh, uh, at MIT uh, and then he, he made the move to uh, Berkeley uh, since then, he, uh, he has won. He, he's a member of, you know, the Academy of, of, of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, uh, and, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he's a, a fellow of AAAI. Uh, won the the uh, uh, one of the most prestigious, uh, well, several of the most prestigious awards. Uh, in the fields, in, including the uh, the ACM AAAI Allen Newell uh, Newell Award, as well as the von, the IEEE von Neumann Prize, uh, and and the Ulf Grinander uh, uh, Award also in, in in the field of control. So, I could probably speak for an hour uh, introducing Mike. I look forward to kind of uh, his uh, spin on decision making. Uh, in, in, in the fields of machine learning and AI, and especially the angles on uh, uh, economics. Uh, uh, that's an area I learned uh, the most about when I was doing uh, the Yahoo Research Labs. I learned so much from our economists. So looking forward to what Mike has to share with us. So Mike, uh, over to you, please. All right, thanks for the fun introduction. It's nice to see you again, and nice to be joining everybody in Boston. Um, so let me take just a second to do the share screen activity here. Um, start my slides. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about the decision making side of machine learning. Um, and uh, really, this is kind of about, you know, a little bit of uh, where are we uh, as a field? Um, uh, you know, what are our goals? Um, you know, where are we going? And how do we take kind of the big picture of building systems at scale? That have data and and flows and and uh, and turn that into actual research directions. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of both. The first part will be kind of you know philosophical aspiration issues, and then we'll try to turn that into actual research directions and you know mathematics and uh, and systems building and so on and so forth. Um, all right. So let me start by um, first of all, my, my own background is is really control theory originally, and I still kind of think like a control theorist. Um, you know, bigger systems, what's the overall system, what are the feedback loops, um, you know, and, and then, you know, over time, it's become much more economic, because there's always interactions in the real world, we're not, if we're inside the computer, you don't have to think about the scarcity and the interactions in the real world so much, but we're no longer just inside the computer, we really are interact with the real world, and economics perspectives is just critically important here, and so I'm, I'm also just enjoying the, bringing that perspective together with some of the other things I knew in the past. Um, all right, so uh, machine learning or AI, whatever you want to call it, these are the buzzwords of the day. Um, uh, you know, really it's focused in the last 10 years on pattern recognition. Uh, that terminology is from the 60s and 70s. There was a book on pattern recognition. And if you look at that book, in fact, Dude and Hart, um, it's gradient descent and uh, parameterized, you know, systems um, and, uh, you know, a loss function and so on. So it's, it's really very much the, the current era. 
Um, we've just kind of done this at much, much larger scale and gradient descent seems to scale. So that's wonderful. Um, it's become a commodity from a computer science point of view. You can download the huge platforms that kind of allow you to do these things at scale. Um, so you, you would be forgiven for thinking that we've really kind of, you know, solved some of the open problems of the past. So we have uh, artificial intelligence systems that um, we, we can, you know, solve massive uh, technical and kind of commercial challenges. And I don't think that's true yet. Um, you know, there's, there's a few uh, counterexamples, but I think mostly, you know, productivity is actually not up because of this last wave of technology. Um, the pattern recognition systems are limited. They don't uh, solve the problem. It's not enough to predict about the world. You got to couch it in these broader perspectives of decision making and, 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 um, and robustness and multiple agents and so on. So before you could actually even start to think about deploying these things. Uh, so I want to focus on what are the research challenges on the decision making side. Uh, it's not just about thresholding. It's not just about a closed feedback loop. It, it is a whole bunch of other issues that are statistical, economic, and uh, and even you know legal and regulatory. Uh, so we'll get in all the way to market mechanisms, but I want to kind of get there through thinking about decisions just a little bit. Um, and I'd like to just to be really concrete about thinking about this. Um, let's imagine that you've gone to the doctor in a few years, and um, the doctor is in possession of the world's largest um, medical neural network. It's been trained on all the world's medical data. So all the hospitals have contributed and all the past data is in there. And so, uh, and it's, you know, been really trained uh, on a very large scale. Um, and so they measure now lots of things about you. you. Um, maybe they take your entire genome and they, they measure you know, 100,000 variables about you. And that is an input vector into this very large neural network. Um, and the output vector of that is kind of, uh, you know, some values that are presumably predictions about you and your, your health. So maybe one of the output units is a prediction about you having a heart attack. And if that number is over 0.7, uh, that means on, based on the historical data that, that the network has analyzed, um, you know, you're about ready to have a heart attack and you need to do something. Maybe you have an operation today. Uh, so in what sense is that, is that a decision? you know, that we should just kind of embed that in the medical system, you know, and just, okay, this person has that operation now because the network said so. Um, and I, I would argue that you're not even close. It's not, it's not at all a decision. Um, so first of all, the first thing you, you will do if presented with that number by your doctor uh, is that you'll ask some questions about uncertainty. Um, you know, so maybe the, the threshold is 0.7 and your number is 0 0.701. Um, and so you're going to want to know, well, how sure are you of that 0.701? Or, or that 0.7 for that matter. And, and sure doesn't just mean a little Gaussian error bar or a little bit of sampling you know, error bar kind of thing. It means um, where did that data come from? Is that recent data? Is that 10 years out of date? Um, was it gathered on people like me or was it gathered on other populations? Um, for what purpose was the data gathered? Um, and so on and so forth. There's be all kinds of questions about really the provenance of the data over long stretches of time because that's how our systems are gonna be behaving. It's not just for today, uh, the data often sit there for years. Um, and so kind of database style thinking has got to come into play to help you craft a notion of uncertainty when you're making decisions. All right, now with your doctor, you're gonna sit there and start to understand maybe a little of the uncertainty, but you're now gonna do, um, you're gonna ask what if questions, you know, uh, what if I were to exercise more? What if I were to change my diet or whatever? Moreover, you're gonna remember things you, you hadn't remembered before that came up in the moment. So you could say, oh, you know, I now remember I had asthma as a child. Maybe that's relevant. Or, or my parents had, you know, one of my parents had heart disease. We never talked about that, but it, I, I think it's true. And you're going to realize there's all kinds of data that comes up at the moment that actually wasn't relevant before. And so it wasn't in that world's largest neural network. Okay. Um, so that network is actually missing a lot of the key ingredients for the decision in the moment. Uh, so we're really getting closer to reasoning, if you will. Uh, it's not just about pattern recognition based on the past and being as good as possible, and now you're done with the problem. It's always in the moment, and um, you know, uh, thinking about what if experiments, even running more data analysis in that moment with your kind of what if experiment. Um, you know, add that as what if data to the to the overall network. Uh, analyze again and see what outcome you get, and kind of think you know game theoretically, if you will, as well. Um, so that's just kind of a typical decision making of a real human being in a consequential situation. Um, and moreover, today I'm making several consequential decisions. Uh, some of them are, I'm in the middle of them, they last a few months. Some of them, you know, are, are just today's decisions or whatever, and they all interact in various ways. 
Um, you know, so I am really a kind of a complicated system, uh, making all kinds of uh, decisions of, you know, with various levels of uncertainty. I'm also gathering data to reduce my uncertainty um, and, and so on. Moreover, I'm interacting with others uh, as I'm doing all these things. Um, I'm learning from the environment. Uh, my data is having an effect on the environment and not just the environment, other people. We're all federated by the, um, the, the medical system. Um, we're all federated by transportation systems. We're all federated by uh, all kinds of commerce and so on. And so this is really the right level of analysis. We should be thinking about that overall system, uh, how it takes in data, how it um, you know, helps with decisions, doesn't just make decisions. Um, and um, how to kind of think about building a healthy version of that system that serves you know, everybody well and doesn't have terrible failures and all that. So to me, that's the real problem of if you want to call it AI, that's the real problem is that overall system. It's not the replace a human with a, with a thinking computer and you know, plug that thinking computer in and it'll just, it'll help. Um, you know, no, it needs to be thought about the over, context of the overall system. Um, now, if you're an economist, this is kind of obvious, or even a control theorist, I think it's obvious. Um, but an economist will additionally add that when, when agents interact in the real world, there's scarcity and there's competition. You can't just have an agent making a prediction and then saying, here's my decision, because my decision may act, we act with yours. We may, we may want the same thing, and we can't both have the same thing. Uh, so uh, you could just say, well, the machine learning system did its best, and now I fight it out. But no, the overall economic system should have realized there was a bit of a game here and maybe there's a win-win situation and should have worked all that out as part of the overall system. Um, so just again, to stay very concrete about decision-making, let's think about uh, classical recommendation systems. Um, you know, so, you know, Netflix and, and, and Amazon, you know, and now many, many, many companies, probably most companies that are doing anything with commerce are using them. Um, and uh, they're, a, they're a bit of pattern recognition system. They find patterns in previous people's purchase patterns, transactions, and make, make uh, suggestions to other people. It's definitely not a decision-making system, but it's a suggestion-making prediction system. Uh, I would argue that even though this isn't called AI, really, at least it wasn't at the time, this has had a huge productivity change on American or worldwide economy uh, in ways that uh, our current uh, wave of AI is not having yet. Um, all right, so it's a, it's a commodity. You can actually download software that'll do you know, large scale recommendations based on kind of matrix data of you know, people and items or people and people and so on. Uh, so that's great, but a lot of times the designers of these systems don't really think about the real world deployment. And in the real world, there's gonna be scarcity and there's gonna be competition. Um, so first of all, in the, in the not real world, think about recommending movies to people um, like, you know, like Netflix. Um, if your system's only being used by a few people, um, you can recommend whatever movies and it's fine. And, but as soon as the system starts to be used by many people, like, you know, millions, um, it's quite possible you could recommend the same movie to, you know, a few hundred thousand people. Um, and if you do, that's not a problem because there's no scarcity in the computer. You just copy the bits. Uh, same thing with books. You could recommend if you're, again, you become Amazon and everyone's using your system, uh, you could recommend the same book to 100,000 people. And if they all buy it, uh, you just print the book very, very quickly, print on demand. Um, but now if you take that same metaphor, that same actual working system out in the real world, uh, you're going to create troubles. Uh, so if you start using a, if you, start, if you build an app to make restaurant recommendations to someone, say, in the city of New York or Shanghai, and if everyone starts using the app, um, then just using the commodity software, you could easily recommend the same restaurant to 10,000 people. Um, and you're going to create a line down the street. Um, and now the question is, how do you solve that problem? How do you, how do you deal with that? It's, you know, so a naive pr perspective would be, it's just load balancing. I've just got to make sure I don't do that. I just kind of, you know, uh, you know, maybe randomly sample and send, you know, only a uh, hundred people to that restaurant and don't, you know, um, but that's not a very economically efficient thing to do, right? It could be that many of those people don't care about that restaurant so much. They would have been happy with some other restaurant and, other people might care more and it might depend on the day and the situation. And, and so really people want to be in, in kind of a market at this point. They want to sort of express their utilities and uh, you know, there should be some notion of kind of values and bids and, and so on um, to build a system that actually starts to serve a lot of people in a kind of a, a way that makes people happy. Um, same kind of thing about streets and drivers. If I build a system that sends people to the fastest route to the airport, um, and everybody in the city starts using my app, um, I, you know, I'm going to create congestion. 
And so this in fact happens in real life and people have thought about this. And I think this again is where uh, the IT companies are not really thinking out of the box. They're, they're thinking too much like uh, system, you know, CS people. I'm, I just have a load balancing problem. I just don't send too much traffic there. I, I, I spread it out. Um, really, but it's, it's really, that's not, um, you know, uh, economically healthy. Um, and, and you're never going to know which route I prefer to go on just based on my past history. So uh, same with restaurants. You're not going to know which restaurant I really prefer because of my past browsing history or something. That's, that's kind of the, the, the current uh, Silicon Valley way of thinking. I know everything about you like in an advertising market. Therefore, I can predict what you're going to click on. Therefore, I can you know, do the load balancing myself. Rather, you don't know everything about me. I don't even know my, about my own self. I don't know in that moment which restaurant I might prefer. I might want to sample something brand new, or I might have some, you know, I read something earlier today that made me think of something. Or with routes to the airport, maybe today I'd like to, you know, go up in the mountains and see something different, or maybe I'm not in a hurry or whatever. Um, same thing about thing, you know, financial markets, recommending stock purchases. You can easily destabilize the market by recommending to too many people. So there are interactions among decisions, and this shouldn't be just left to the end stage that you patch up the output of your system. It should be fully part of the design. Um, so the alternative is really kind of simple-minded here, but it's going to, of course, become quite rich as we start to think this through, is that really the alternative is, is at least in part to create a two-way market. So just classically, you have consumers on one side, producers on the other side. Uh, now, um, we're talking about scales that are not standard markets. Uh, so, you know, uh, people in Shanghai going to restaurants, there's, you know, probably millions of restaurants and there's certainly, you know, tens of millions of people. And it's a matching between the two sides. And there's no way that uh, a given customer will have a preference ordering on all the restaurants uh, in their head. Um, and similarly, the restaurants don't know enough about the customer. So they have to also have recommendation systems on the two sides. Um, you know, maybe I have a preference over restaurants because you've been to the restaurant before and you're my friend. Uh, so we start to build social networks on the two sides. Also, the restaurants will have links among them as well. Um, and all of the examples I gave there, it's kind of interesting to think about the two-way market that really is needs to be built here and the recommendation systems on both sides to support that uh, and the exploration exploitation trade-offs that will emerge as this system starts to work and how the data will flow and how that'll lead to social value and so on and so forth. And also how all this could fail, how it could create lack of fairness and it could create long tail problems and so on. Um, so this is you know, kind of microeconomics language, but it's not just microeconomics, it's recommendation systems, it's statistics and uh, data analysis and uh, human values and, and so on to start to think about this kind of thing. Um, all right, so instead of going on and on about kind of the the philosophical level, let's start to be again more concrete. I'm going to give a real world example, then I'm going to turn to actual kind of academic research. Um, so one of my favorite illustrations of the, of the conundrum we're in right now is music in, in the data age. Um, so more people are making music than ever before and, and they're placing it on sites such as SoundCloud. Um, you know, you can make music on your laptop and a lot of people do. A lot of 16 year olds do this on the weekend or when they come home from school or whatever. And a lot of them are really, really good at it. Uh, so much so that if you listen, if you look at the data, um, you know, 95% of the songs being listened to today in the US um, are by people that you've never heard of and their songs made in the last few months, uh, 95%. So this is actual data. Um, you know, it's not the case that everyone's listening to Beyonce or Taylor Swift or the Beatles. Um, you know, in fact, a small fraction are listening to it. Most people are listening to other things that they hear around them and are maybe part of some network they belong to. Um, so that sounds great. There must be a wonderful market here supporting all of this and people are happy and uh, people are making money by making music and so on. And that's mostly all false, it's not true. Um, so the, the mu music industry still exists and it still picks out a few people like a Beyonce and gives them vast amounts of money, but it doesn't pay the people who are actually making the music that people are really listening to. Um, so what happens is, of course, Spotify and other services stream the music they find on SoundCloud to people. They have to create a revenue stream, uh, but they don't do it by linking the producer and the consumer directly like in a classical business. What they do is they create an artificial market, an advertising market, or maybe a subscription model uh, that gives them money. And then maybe by generosity, they throw a little bit of money back at the musician. Uh, that's not a very healthy, uh, they're not really building that real two-way market that is latent here. Um, so now a lot of people can't have this as their full-time job. A lot of jobs are going missing. 
And it's not that AI is responsible at all here, but AI is actually missing the boat by not thinking about, oh, what's the data here? And what is actual the economic value? How do I link data to economic value? All right. And so it's not that hard to start to, you don't even have to be deeply into the latest AI techniques to think about uh, using data to provide economic value. So imagine creating a dashboard for musicians. So every person who's uh, making music on, say, a site like SoundCloud that's at all popular, at the end of the week would see a map of the United States or whatever country they live in. And they'd see a dot every time one of their songs has been listened to in some city. Um, and they would, from that data, um, discover, see that maybe they were popular in Cleveland, Ohio, you know, 10,000 people listened to their songs. Um, and they would um, alert the venue owners in, in Cleveland that, hey, I'm popular in your city. The venue owners would see it, that's true. And um, the venue owners would suggest they come give a show in Cleveland. Um, more, they would go there more of they know who's listening to them because they've been connected by the network and uh, they could advertise to those people that are coming and uh, they could make, you know, $20,000. And if they do that three times during the year, that starts to be a salary. Um, and the market could create other kinds of, you know, uh, uh, transactions. People, uh, you know, a musician could offer to come play at someone's wedding and so on and so forth. Um, all right, so um, this has actually been done. There's a company called United Masters. Um, I'm actually on the board here, so I have a little involvement. And my involvement is because I was connected to Steve Stout, who's down there in the uh, lower right there, an uh, entrepreneur and, and sort of a musician or a producer um, and, um, uh, you know, had, had a visionary. Um, and so, um, yeah, you know, his vision was, in fact, the one I'm alluding to here, which was that musicians should be possessing a dashboard and they should be possessing a, a way to um, to run their own little business based on their music effectively by being linked to listeners. Um, and so United Masters is a company that does this. There's a million musicians, uh, you know, especially like inner city youth who are musicians now on the United Masters platform. And the NBA website, for example, the music that's being played behind NBA clips is the music from the United Masters musicians. And they're directly getting the money from the, the NBA for, for that, that music being played. Um, and so Steve, in fact, you know, went to both sides of this market. He went to the NBA on the one hand, then he went to the musicians on the other and made that, that possible. Um, you, you can imagine a million musicians in every country. And you can imagine now thinking about this more broadly, not just for music, but for other kinds of information flow and entertainment. And all behind this is computer science and AI and economics and control systems. But we really don't have the research to support a lot of this. There's going to be a lot of troubles and a lot of uh, failures um, if we don't, uh, you know, Steve is kind of doing this as a, as a pioneer. Um, but we have problems we haven't even begun to face when we put all these kind of ideas together. Uh, so the opportunity, you know, though, is great. Uh, it'll create new jobs. So this is where AI can actually be used to create jobs for people who don't have them otherwise and not you know, remove people from jobs. Um, and this is maybe so, this is obvious, but it's just not the mindset of Silicon Valley. The mindset of Silicon Valley is the goal of AI is to replicate human thought in the computer, make humans dispensable effectively by making computers just as good as humans or even better. Um, and um, maybe if that's not the immediate goal to replace humans, it's kind of the natural outcome. Um, so instead of trying to make, you know, computers uh, as good as humans or better at what humans already do well, um, instead make computers be complementary to humans and, and, and think about the, the data flows and the analyses and the systems you have to build to make that possible. Um, and not enough people are thinking about that. The AI mythology of creating the superhuman uh, thinking computer and, and, and hoping that that'll somehow solve the world's problems. Um, it's overly um, is overly present in our in our world in our VC community and in, in our academic community. Um, okay, so that's sort of my first part of my talk. Let me now turn to real problems as academics and researchers that we can that we can address and start to think about here. Uh, some of them are not new, but some of them you know have a a, a new flavor to them, uh, especially in the context of large scale uh, systems and platforms. Um, so multi-way markets in which agents have to explore to learn their preferences. I've already alluded to this, but the word explore is critical there. The classical economic model, there really wasn't an exploration part to it. Um, you know, there's always exceptions. There's some of that in the e econ literature, but mostly not. Uh, you assume the preferences were known or you assume the distributions over preferences were known. Um, recommendation systems related with markets, you know, how, and then information sharing, free writing problems, issues. How, again, how do you have agents together 
uh, finding uh, opportunities and sharing information about those opportunities. Auctions, when we learn preferences, we'll talk about that a little bit. Incentive aware uh, pattern recognition. So classification is a pattern recognition problem, but when you have self-interested agents, it becomes a incentive uh, aware classification. And um, other kinds of social, uh, you know, privacy, fairness, and social good issues certainly have an economics perspective uh, that helps you think about them and um, build systems that uh, respect them. Um, okay, uh, last little comment before I move into actual, you know, projects. Uh, Again, that a lot of this thinking is not particularly new. Um, the idea that markets themselves are algorithms is, is not a new idea, but just to lean into it a little bit, you know, a market is a decentralized algorithm. Um, it doesn't rely on huge intelligence by each of the participants, just a little bit of intelligence. And the overall market delivers more intelligence. Uh, and that kind of intelligence is often not part of our AI discourse. Uh, we think of the intelligent agent um, be a lot of intelligence going into the agent per se, and, and, and uh, then we have to worry a little bit about the interface. Um, but really, we should be thinking more in this economic metaphor to help get us going because uh, markets are adaptive. You know, they, they, uh, they work, they're robust. They've been working for, you know, even you know, decades, even centuries in some domains. Um, and they're not perfect. And there's lots of research needed to make them even better in new domains. Um, you know, so uh, even things like you know, second price auctions only were discovered recently in history, not that long ago. And um, uh, it, it was discovered because there was a, a need of a new kind of market that was emerging. And we have all kinds of new markets emerging. I've already alluded to some when data is present, and uncertainty is present, and multi agents are present um, uh, at a very large scale. Uh, so there's all kinds of research opportunities. Um, all right, so here's an outline of some of the topics that I've selected. This is an area, that, you know, overall that I've been working in for about a decade. Um, and I want to emphasize a couple of them and have maybe somehow the strongest economics flavor. Um, uh, all of these are on my website. If you're interested, you, you go to my publications page, you'll see papers on all of these topics and you'll see the specific results I'm referring to. So I won't get into huge details, but I'm going to uh, at least kind of uh, give the flavor of the, um, the kind of mathematics we're doing and the kind of results we're able to get. And also the purpose, why are we doing these things? Um, so the first thing I want, the first uh, vignette I want to start with is about bandit, multi-armed bandits uh, put together with matching markets. Uh, so multi-armed bandits are one of my favorite ideas in, in learning. Um, they are not supervised learning. They're learning where you don't know the right outcome or the right action, and you have to explore to find the right action. It's part of the learning problem. Um, and then on the game theory or mechanism design side, met matching markets are kind of one of my favorite examples of mechanism design. Uh, so this is work with Lydia Liu, who's a student with me at Berkeley, and Horia Mania, who was a student, but who's now in the Boston, who's at MIT as a postdoc. All right, so multi-armed bandits, hopefully all of you know what they are. Um, they are a model of a choice. Um, an agent is trying to choose between a set of actions um, and ideally maximize their reward. So they choose our arm one and they get out a reward from some unknown distribution. Um, uh, they want to make the maximal reward highest. And so they have to try each one of the arms and see what rewards they're getting, but it's stochastic or maybe even adversarial. Uh, so they get a range of possible rewards. Um, so how do they start to hone in on the right arm that gives them the most reward over time? Um, you know, and exploit that arm by picking that arm repeatedly, but also to explore all of the arms to make sure that they're getting the best arm over time. So that's a trade-off. Um, and there are many algorithms that manage that trade-off effectively. One of them is known as upper confidence bound. Um, this is an algorithm that is, does a little bit of statistics. For every arm, it forms a, uh, a confidence interval on the mean reward. So after a certain number of trials, you might have those three confidence intervals on the right there. Um, and the confidence intervals can be formed in various ways. You know, typical is like a Huffington bound. Um, and the algorithm says, I'm going to pick the uh, confidence interval that has the largest upper bound, and I'm going to select that arm. Um, and that's a, a smart idea for two reasons. It does both exploration and exploitation. Um, it does exploitation because um, that upper confidence bound could be high because the overall distribution is shifted up and to the right, uh, meaning the mean reward is likely to be high for a, a, a you know if the upper confidence bound is high. Um, but it could be that the upper confidence is high just because I'm very uncertain about that arm. I have a very wide confidence interval, so I nonetheless should still pick the arm because that'll reduce my uncertainty. 
and um, probably pick it a few times, the, um, un the confidence will, will reduce and maybe I'll now know it's a good arm or maybe I'll now know it's a bad arm. Um, anyway, this algorithm runs and um, you can measure its quality in terms of a notion called regret. Uh, regret measures the expected performance, the expected reward you're getting over time relative to an oracle who knew the best arm a priori. Okay, so that difference is called regret. Um, and the regret's going to grow, hopefully slowly over time as you're learning. And the best algorithms in this particular case grow at a logarithmic rate. You get logarithmic regret. Um, okay, so that's on the learning side. On the um, matching market side, um, matching markets, you know, by, by, uh, bipartite graphs, you have buyers on one side, sellers on the other. Um, and classically, at least, you assume you knew that the... the um, uh, the preferences on each, on both sides. So um, both buyers and sellers write down their preferences for the other side of the market. Um, maybe there's a distribution known in some cases, but at least there's there's a lot of knowledge assumed known a priori here. Um, Gale and Shapley, you know, many of you will know about the stable marriage um, algorithm. Um, you know, they they define an, a, an algorithm where there's bids made from one side, buyers, you know, uh, select sellers, sellers accept or, or reject, and this algorithm proceeds um, and eventually finds a stable outcome, uh, one in which there's no pair of buyer and seller who would prefer somebody else. Uh, that's used in the real world in lots of problems. There's lots of famous ones, you know, matching uh, workers or like labor markets or, or kidney exchanges and so on and so forth. These are markets where there's no exchange of money. Um, so this is kind of, you know, uh, mechanism design without money. Um, all right, so obviously there's an interesting question here about putting the two together. Oh, um, because in, in the real world, uh, as I alluded to, like in the restaurant example, um, I probably don't have preferences over the entire side of the other side of the market. I may have no preferences. I may have to have a little bit of experience, first of all, to structure my preferences. Uh, so what if I start thinking of a banded algorithm where I start to pull the arms on the other side um, and I start to learn which of the other side I prefer, but the other agents are doing that simultaneously. We're all interacting by this system. Uh, can we build an effective learning market in this kind of uh, in this kind of uh, situation? And I would argue this is this is a match to certain kinds of real world markets where people are actually experience it as the matchings are being formed. All right, so uh, here let's suppose we have two agents, and let's focus on the case where the two agents are you know selecting these arms, and and they happen to select the same arm. So here, both the human and the bear have selected arm two. All right, so in our model, um, we assume that only one of them gets a reward. In this case, the bear gets a reward and the uh, human gets no reward. Um, there is other work where people have studied this where neither of them get a reward. Those are congestion channels. Uh, ours is different. This is more like an economic uh, model where, uh, of scarcity, where there's only uh, allocation to one of the uh, agents who've selected arm two. But which one of them gets the arm? Uh, well, remember, the arms also have preferences back on the other side of the market. So in this case, arm two seems to prefer the bear over the human. Uh, so the human observes this, um, and they start to realize that even though they like arm two, the bear also seems to like arm two. And when the bear selects it, the human loses. So the human better explore the other arms more than uh, he otherwise would. Um, and that last statement suggests there's going to be extra regret to pay because of the presence of this other agent in the market. Uh, for the human. Um, so can we quantify that regret and still assure ourselves that this kind of system will learn over time? Uh, so we want to build this bandit market where we have agents who are getting noisy rewards and they're interacting with each other. Um, so again, details I don't want to get into too much here, but just to say that there's a natural notion of regret here. Regret always is relative to some oracle. Uh, this particular oracle is if you knew the mean rewards a priori, and you ran the Gale Shapley algorithm on those mean rewards, what matching would form? And suppose that matching just was repeatedly formed, we'd get a certain set of rewards. Uh, how do we do relative to that? Um, and so we, we call that the stable regret. Um, so could we do relative with the learning algorithm? We do relatively well uh, relative to this stable regret. Um, okay, so we've studied a number of actual algorithms to see how well they do. And, and um, you know, this is one particular algorithm. We call this Gale Shapley upper confidence bound. This is a centralized version. We also worked on decentralized problems. Uh, in this algorithm, each one of the, uh, the agents uh, has a confidence bound on each one of the arms, and they send the upper confidence bound to Gale Shapley. Gale Shapley runs on the upper confidence bounds, produces a matching, um, 
the arms then get the reward corresponding to the matching, and then they update their upper confidence balance and the algorithm iterates. Okay, so pretty straightforward blending of, uh, of UCB and Gale Shapley. Um, and we're able to prove a theorem which shows that you actually still get logarithmic regret in this setting. Um, so the key in that little equation there is logarithm of n, n is the number of time steps. Um, and uh, do you, as I alluded to earlier, you must have a little higher regret because of the presence of the other agent. And that's captured by this term delta squared. A uh, delta is an overlap distribution between the reward distributions. So if I have high overlap with other agents, um, as I alluded to, that's going to give you a, um, a, 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 a regret, but it's only a constant term. Okay, the delta will be small and that'll make the regret go up, but it's a constant term. I still am getting logarithmic regret. All right, and the last little point on the bottom of that page is important, which is that this particular algorithm actually turns out to be incentive compatible. If everybody is playing this algorithm, then I'm actually incentivized to continue to play the algorithm myself as well. Um, okay, that was just a little research vignette. Um, this was uh, two or three years ago, and now there's a little literature developing, and there's much, much more to do here. Um, particular, um, we didn't get into um, recommendations, uh, you know, and kind of social network blending with this. We, each agent with their own kind of, they didn't have any side information and so on. Uh, that's an area we're starting to work on and uh, many, many open problems uh, around this, this particular little area. Um, all right, so I'm going to turn to just a couple of other vignettes. Um, this one is another blending of machine learning and with um, strategic con considerations, game theoretic considerations. Um, this is going to be kind of pure pattern recognition, um, so classification problems. Uh, and uh, Tiana Zernich is a student working with me at Berkeley, and Eric Mazumdar was a student with me, with me at Berkeley who's now a professor at Caltech. Um, okay, so uh, we're talking about decision-making in the face of strategic behavior here. So imagine um, that you are filling out, for example, a health insurance form because uh, your insurance company has asked you to do so. Um, and that's going to go into a big machine learning system that makes a prediction about you know, your health uh, and your insurance rates are going to be set accordingly. Um, so something like this, of course, already does happen and it's problematic in various ways. Um, um, you know, uh, critically, uh, we're in the setting of a strategic situation. I have a vested interest in the outcome. So um, I may um, not actually be honest. And so the health insurance company is going to have to be, you know, find ways to ensure that I'm honest. But um, it's not possible to entirely ensure I'm honest. Um, I'm incentivized to not be honest. All right. So um, the health insurance company will. Um, not just ask me to write down a bunch of facts and numbers, they'll ask me to do things in the real world that, you know, that are expensive to me in some way. Um, so it's hard for me to be dishonest. You know, so an example is the health insurance company might ask for access to my cell phone um, and it records the kind of accelerations of the cell phone during the day and tries to infer from that how, um, how sedentary I am, whether I do exercise or not. Um, so this is a real thing and people, somebody built a device that you put your cell phone in the device and it moves the cell phone around all day long um, and the health company thinks you're doing exercise. Um, so you've now changed your data to get an outcome that you prefer. And, and this kind of thing happens all the time. And, and it's not just it's that it's dishonest and we should like regulate it away. You just can't, this is how humans behave. Uh, economists are very aware of this. Uh, they, they refer to these kind of things as Goodhart's law. Uh, here, for example, you someone defined the poverty index score in 1994 uh, by 2003 that, that nice bell-shaped curve uh, had, uh, had gone away. You have a very tilted distribution where everybody is, is, is shifted into the uh, low, into high poverty. Um, and it's partly, not entirely, but it's partly because people realized how to make themselves appear more poor because they get more benefits if they do. Um, all right, here's another example. Um, Uber uh, you know, had, had the Uber drivers around the Los Angeles airport, um, you know, uh, formed a little bit of coalition, um, they realized that if they all turn the cell phone off at some time like noon, that the automatic pricing algorithm would recognize the lack of supply and the, um, the price would go up and up and up, you know, and so then maybe 30 minutes later, they all would turn back their cell phones and they would all get a high price. Um, and uh, they did this. Uh, so they created surge pricing. Um, and again, this is something you just can't rule out. It's part of how humans behave. Okay, so there's gonna be in general feedback loops in learning. There's gonna be a strategic agents 
and there's going to be a decision maker and they have different goals. Um, and there's going to be an equilibrium of some kind we have to think about between the predictive model and the strategic data. They're going to adapt to each other's actions. Uh, so it's game theoretic, but it's also all about the data. It's all about um, the value of the data and uh, the predictive power of the data and so on. Um, so one way to think about this is in terms of a Stackelberg game. If you've done, if you've done a little bit of game theory, you'll know um, some of the uh, uh, equilibria that people study are Nash equilibria, others are Stackelberg, and there's other kinds of equilibria. Stackelberg are the sequential equilibria, where one agent acts and then the other agent acts. And that's appropriate in this situation. Uh, you gather data from people, you look at the data, you build a model, and you send the model back out. And maybe for regulatory reasons, you um, people have to look at your model, maybe, uh, or maybe you just, for honesty or transparency, you want to publish at least some aspect of the model. Um, okay, so uh, we have a Stackelberg game in which we have a leader and we have a follower. Now notice it's um, not clear who, who, to who it's an advantage to be the leader or the follower. You know, if I'm the leader, um, you get to watch what I do and respond to that. So you seem like you have some advantage, but because I'm the leader, I know how you're likely to react. So I take that into account when I'm picking my action. Um, so it's not clear who's, who, to who it's an advantage to lead and who to follow. Classically, uh, in, uh, well, it's not even classical, this is all kind of new, um, but the decision maker was assumed to be the leader. You would gather lots of data and you would very, you have a powerful computer, you would update the model very, very quickly. You would do a best response to the agents and the agents would then over time react to you. All right, so that would be uh, the setup of the Sackleberg game. You announce a model, um, the agents observe, and then they choose some data and send it back to you and this continues to iterate. So for example, credit scoring would be an, maybe an example of this. And agents would see the credit scoring system being built and take actions to improve their credit score, which may come at some cost. All right, now, so um, you can um, change the equilibrium by having different dynamics here. So we actually don't want just to get into equilibrium, we want, we want to get into dynamical systems. Um, and so the, the decision maker has a choice to make. They can either um, respond immediately or, or they can actually slow down things. They can respond from time to time, all right? So here's a situation where the uh, decision maker decides, no, I'm not gonna respond to me. I'm gonna kind of wait, gather some data and then uh, let, let the agents best respond to me. And then I'm gonna slowly adjust to them. So I'm gonna be the follower in the Stackelberg game. Agent, uh, the, the decision maker can do this, all right? Now, uh, so we call these two kind of modes decision of decision making, proactive and reactive. You can either have the decision making means slow relative to agents. We call it the proactive case, or you can have it being the other way around. So the slow case is like in college admissions or credit scoring. Uh, the college is not going to change their admissions model based on everybody's application one after another. They're going to collect data, and then from from time to time they will adjust things. Uh, whereas the other way around, where the decision maker is very rapid, that's what we see kind of on the internet. Uh, so online platforms are adjusting their model very, very quickly, and we're best responding to that, presumably. Um, so the question is, which is best? And as always in game three, you gotta ask who, best for who? Um, and it turns out that this, on, this latter example is actually best for the central decision maker, um, but it's actually quite bad for the uh, strategic agents, no surprise. And the question is, well, if you turn it around the other way, would it be bad for the central decision maker? So Google or whatever wouldn't be incentivized to do it. All right, so it turns out we have a new result. Uh, it's really a new game theoretic result, which is it turns out you get different stack of equilibria depending on the dynamics. And there is a, a um, uh, in, the, in the learning setting where the, the central agent is building a machine learning model, it turns out both players, the central agent and the strategic agent prefer the equilibrium where the strategic agent leads and the decision maker follows. Okay, so a slow decision maker is actually preferable both to the strategic agents and to the decision maker themselves. Uh, that's actually not trivial, it's a surprise. Um, and it's an example of what happens when you bring a little game theory together with a little bit of, um, of statistical machine learning. Um, okay, so I'm gonna maybe go another five minutes or so if I think I, think if I understand correctly, that's the time. Uh, tell me if it's not, please. Um, that's, that's correct. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so let me just give you another vignette, um, and I will have done three out of four. Maybe I'll allude to the fourth one very quickly. But uh, this is work with Wunshuo Go and Manola Sampatakis, who are again with me at Berkeley. We're interested in auctions, which is, of course, a you know a mechanism per, par excellence. 
Um, and we're interested in robust learning of auctions. So we're learning auctions. That's often, that's not been a thing. Um, and we're doing that in a, in a robust setting. And I'll tell you why. All right. So uh, you all know what auctions are. They happen, you know, all the time in our world and they're happening more and more. Uh, as I alluded to with like, with like restaurants and uh, highways, I think that over time they'll even be more present. Uh, there'll be lots of bids on various kinds of economic goods in the world. Um, in classical auctions, you assume you knew uh, the valuations of people, you know, the distribution of valuations a priori. And, and again, in learning, we don't like to make those kind of assumptions. All right, so we're going to gather data uh, from repeated auctions and use that data to inform the design of the next auction. Um, right, but, but now when we use learning to uh, collect data, um, even in classical learning, we worry about robustness and adversarial issues, but here it's even worse because we really have strategic agents and we have to assume they're gonna be uh, strategic and maybe some of them will be adversarial or some of them are thinking about, well, if I give false data now, that's gonna help me later on in a future auction, all right? So we have to take that much more into account even than in classical machine learning. All right, so we've, we've, got, we've written a paper on this where we've, we've gone through the classical Meyerson auction that many of you will know about. And we've designed an empirical Meyerson auction, first of all, so we brought in data and then we robustified it in a way that's uh, I'm gonna tell you about. All right, so uh, there's, a, there's a true valuation distribution, which we don't know, but we assume that we get valuations which are a perturbed version of that. Um, and we assume they're um, within a, a factor alpha of, a, of the true distribution in, in Kolmogorov Smirnov distance. Kolmogorov Smirnov allows you to have arbitrary movement of the probability mass for a fraction alpha of the distribution. All right, so that's a, um, it's not like an earth mover or a KL distance where you can't have arbitrary movement. Here we allow arbitrary adversarial behavior on for a fraction alpha. All right. And so our little model here is that we have this true distribution D star, corrupted distributions D tilde, and there's a, KL, a, a KS distance of alpha between them. And then I'm going to show you a theorem on this page. Um, again, no details here really, but uh, if you use the corrupted distribution, we have a mechanism, a new mechanism that gives you a revenue, which is in a, within a factor of one minus alpha of the optimum that you would have had if you had had the uh, true uncorrupted distribution. All right, more, we would have a sample complexity bound at the bottom of the page there. We know how many learning samples you need to be able to achieve this good auction behavior, all right? Um, and the algorithm that does this is actually somewhat interesting. Um, it's not, I think things like this are gonna be kind of typical. Um, you form the lower convex envelope of a certain object called a link function, which is kind of a, appears in classical auction theory. Um, and you optimize that, you compute, you compute that lower convex envelope and that, that turns out to be the object you use as a virtual value function. All right. Um, Okay, so it is possible to robustify auctions and it's possible to bring learning mechanisms to auctions. And that's, I think, uh, really exciting opportunities are, are appearing there. All right, the last project I'm not gonna get into, but let me just say what it is. This is work with several people at Berkeley um, where we're interested in back to bandits and matching markets, um, but we're interested in learning equilibria here. Okay, we're not just interested in what equilibria rise, we're actually interested in shaping the equilibria. And so we've had to design a new notion of how to measure whether you're in an equilibrium. The classical equilibrium either is zero or one, you're in the equilibrium or you're not. Um, and by bringing in prices and having kind of the, uh, you know, what's called a shapley schubert kind of model, um, we're able to actually have a new quantification of what it means to be a little bit in equilibrium. Um, and so it's kind of a, you know, a coalitional game theory kind of concept. And we, we've been, we have a paper on this. So Mina, Alex, Yishin, and Jacob and I have a paper, which if you're interested in, uh, how do you quantify being a little bit away from equilibrium and how does that affect learning systems? Um, you could read that. Um, let me just say kind of in, in my experience in things like numerical linear algebra and other fields, uh, it's very important to quantify how far you are from singularity. It's not enough just to say I have singularities, but you wanna say how far away am I? And that allows you to design systems that either you know, approach a singularity or ideally stay away from a singularity. And similarly here, if we design uh, measures that are how far are you from equilibrium, then we can um, optimize those things with learning mechanisms and, um, and, and design equilibria and shape them. Okay, so this paper does that. It develops a certain measure of equilibrium. Um, okay, so let me finish. Uh, I had this slide up earlier. Let me just sort of uh, put it back up again as to you know, reframe uh, re, uh, my talk. Um, you know, pattern recognition has been the talk of the era. 
a lot of people have you know made a lot of uh, noise about it. It's certainly it's exciting. Certainly, it, it looks like it does new things. Uh, again, I'm not sure the productivity gains are there yet. We will probably see more over the next decade. Uh, but in the meantime, I want us to realize this is not AI. This is not intelligence. It, it, it's missing the whole decision making side, which has to do with interacting systems, has to do with uncertainties, has to do with high stakes, um, and it has to do with systems level thinking. It's not about an autonomous you know, self-driving car or a autonomous thinking uh, computer that kind of comes in and we have to interact with it, you know, as a, as a separate agent. It really is designing the system that includes these kind of mechanisms as part of their, uh, um, part of their, the design. And then my last slide is just kind of the, the very top philosophical level um, that I don't think our era is about thinking machines really. And I don't think it's about AI yet. Maybe someday it will be, but it's just not really yet. But it really is much more reminiscent of the emergence of other engineering disciplines. Every 50 years or so, there's a new engineering discipline that emerges. So chemical engineering before the 40s and 50s wasn't really a discipline, it wasn't a thing. There was chemistry, there was fluid mechanics and quantum mechanics. So you could understand what happened when you brought chemicals together. Uh, but the concept of building a factory and a whole big system that would bring these things together at scale, and it would actually work, it would make products and it wouldn't explode and it would be economically viable, uh, whole new design principles and whole new really mathematics was needed, you know, new thermodynamics at scale. And that field eventually got called chemical engineering. And it worked, went in tandem with building these systems, building factories. Um, you know, same thing as electrical engineering. Before electrical engineering existed, uh, there was you know, already electromagnetism. There was an understanding of the phenomenon scientifically. Uh, but you had new concepts that were needed like impedance and uh, circuit design and you know, power engineering to kind of build a field called uh, electrical engineering. So I actually, I think that's what's happening right now is that we have um, proto uh, principles from statistics about inference from computation and algorithms um, that allow us to conceive of systems that relate humans and data and transactions and aspirations on the internet um, and, um, and build systems that seemingly help us with our intelligent lives and make our lives safer, more interesting, more productive and so on. Uh, and that is an engineering thing. We're trying to build a system that works and brings value to humans. And differently from the previous uh, versions of engineering, it's not just about things in the world. It's not about stuff, electrons and uh, atoms. Uh, it's about economics ideas and values and decisions and, and human, uh, um, uh, human aspirations. Uh, so uh, it's going to take decades, I think, for this to emerge, just like previous versions of engineering. Uh, and that's what I think is really emerging. It's not, you know, so AI is the buzzword being used for this, and perhaps that's fine. But I think it's really not a particularly good buzzword, and I think we need to stop and slow down and think about what really is happening here. All right, I'm more than happy to answer questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, uh, Mike, for a uh, fascinating talk. I actually had personally a lot of takeaways. Uh, probably one of the most powerful statements you made, just running by it, was it, it's not just about how a decision-making system makes a decision, but but how it helps make a decision, which I think is, is, is critical for our times. Let me, um, uh, there's plenty of questions. Some came ahead of time, some are, are going live. Uh, I don't know if we can make uh, Ryan uh, Eduardo a, um, uh, unmute him uh, and have him ask his question or I'll ask on his behalf. Um, sure. Hi, Mike. Eduardo, Hi. if you're live, you can say your question. Otherwise I'll say it. Uh, uh, yeah. I am. I was. I, I wanted you. to read it. I guess I can't do video. I noticed. I can only do the, the microphone. You are not allowing video. Okay. Anyway, um, I had two questions actually. One of them was I was trying to get it from the chat so that I could look at it again. But uh, one of them was uh, in the introduction you mentioned opti optimal routing of cars. Now in practice, not everybody asks for directions at the same time, right? Once there's asynchrony. Uh, the supply problem disappears, right? Because Google will start sending people a different way because they know this congestion in the way that we're telling everybody to go. So my question is, how does this kind of feedback mechanism fit uh, anything, the other things that you talked about, for instance, in the four vignettes, I don't see it as fitting any of those, but have you thought about this question? It must be obvious that you have thought. Uh, yeah, no, thanks for, uh, you know, you're really expanding the scope of what I was doing in the talk. So, and I think it, which is great. Um, yeah, that vignette, I mean, I didn't really return to, and I wasn't so much thinking about optimal routing. I think, um, you know, there's this notion of price of anarchy, um, you know, in algorithm game theory. I think that's a good way of thinking here. 
there could be some Oracle optimal routing, you know, thing that some smart Oracle could do like a Google or the, or, or the Supreme being. Um, but I don't think in, in human life, that's really what we should be aspiring to. That's sort of too much centralized control. Um, rather we should have kind of some kind of a looser, easier to interact with and trust kind of mechanism that involves some kind of local transparency and bidding and, and awareness on each of us. And we pay a little cost. There's this price of anarchy from being in that kind of system. Um, but, you know, we have kind of a federated notion of contracts of, you know, uh, slots of kind of interactions among each other that allows that to be supported. So um, I have worked on that and some of my other, I could have added that to some of my, one of my vignettes where more you kind of build up, um, you know, I need to know a priori, you know, whether I have a slot or not, you know, like th I think maybe think more about uh, the gig economy where people have cars and trucks and all that and bicycles and they want to help move goods around the city. Right. And there's a matching and there's kind of, uh, you know, so people will often want to know, you know, in advance uh, whether I'm available or not. And a company will want to know whether there's enough kind of supply to, you know, bring my goods around. And there'll be a spot market also near the very end where maybe people make a little extra money. And there'll be a whole little economy based on that. And thinking of that as the optimal routing problem, I don't think is right. It is very asynchronous. It is very, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, that which impacts things. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, I still like the, I think the market metaphor is absolutely totally right on here, but markets include things like contracts. They include things like if you fail, you know, your contract that there's consequences. It includes multiple stages of markets, including spot markets at the end and so on. And I guess what I'm bringing to all this is not just economics language and jargon and all that, but bringing to it an awareness this is all based on the data analysis. Uh, and that's not been the case. So you definitely will see this, uh, you know, I spent a little time, I didn't consult, but I spent a little time at Uber in the beginning. They have these kind of problems emerging. You know, Amazon does this as well. Um, but even in these companies, you don't see a lot of intellectual merging of the full economics market design perspective with a full machine learning and control theoretic uh, perspective. Um, to me, that is, the, that is the grand intellectual challenge, how to make this real scalable, trustable by actual humans, that they don't rely just on a Google to tell them where to go. Um, but they feel like they're part of the you know, engaged in the process. So anyway, that hopefully that kind of got, got at some part of your problem there. Yeah, I, 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 I have another, but I'll let other people ask and I'll get back later with the other question. Yeah, okay. and given that we're running out of time, uh, and if you're open to it, Mike, we, we can, uh, uh, we'll collect some of these great questions and we'll kind of get answers to them offline and then publish them on the website and the social media and so forth. Maybe one last question by uh, Babak Haidari. I don't know if he's, unmuted and would like to uh, make his question. Um, yeah, thanks. I think my question is sort of related to, to the previous question. Um, so when, the, when it comes to um, um, having ML for, for decision making, so uh, like the, especially for public policy decisions, kind of like, like public decisions, trust becomes a um, big issue. So there seems to be kind of like, like a trade-off between the optimality of these uh, decisions and some kind of getting them closer to human intuition. So do you think should, we should compromise, sacrifice some of that optimality of the decision in favor of getting them closer to, to, to the intuition? And if that's the case, is there any formal, are you aware of any formal framework that we can, we can, we can quantify or think about these trade-offs? Uh, thanks again, that wonderful question. Um, both of those are, you know, again, beyond the scope of what I really did talk about, but I definitely think about it. And uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to say a couple of words about it. Um, so uh, yeah, trust, you know, humans trusting a system. Again, it's, it's, um, it's not just that there's an underwriter's laboratory or Intel inside kind of statement on it that, you know, it's been vetted and you should trust it. It's rather after you interact with it, you start to believe in it. You start to believe not just that it works, but it delivers value to you and that you want to continue to be a part of it. Um, and so immediately you're into the game theory, kind of the coalitional side of it. Do I really want to be a part of this or I just want to go somewhere else? Uh, so that's part of trust. And transparency is critically part of this. I got to be able to probe and push and do counterfactuals and see what kind of things come back out of it before I start to trust it. My little interaction with the doctor there was suggesting that. If the doctor can't give me good responses to all my questions about what if I were to do this, what if I were to do this, where's the uncertainty coming from? I start to not trust the doctor and I start to not go down that decision-making path. 
Uh, so our systems have got to be probable after the fact. It's not just that the prediction was made and here were the variables that went into making the predictions and here's the Shapley values, whatever. It's got to be this probing activity and this what if and this kind of back and forth kind of dialogue that's part of the trust and the transparency. Um, you know, so that's the part of the bigger picture. Uh, the other one is, you know, optimality. Yes, optimality is not the right word in here. And again, just as I said earlier, a little bit of a tolerance of, uh, you know, chaos or, you know, price of anarchy that we, uh, we tolerate. We're not optimal, but we're, we're trustable or believable, or we are prepared for the next round of interactions because we understood things better. Those are all part of it too. Finally, there's the interaction to the actual human being. How does this, uh, this trust and transparency sort of arrive? Um, you know, so just to be very concrete, you know, a neural network is something that none of us will never understand, you know, it's input out behavior. And I don't think spending a lot more time on kind of, you know, all the pictures you can show about the, the, the neural network is really the way to go. Uh, so here's another just simple dumb proposal um, for something like, you know, credit worthiness or something. You, I just gone to the bank, you put my data into the network, it, it denied me credit. I say, well, why? And I need an explanation. Um, and maybe for regulatory reasons, you actually have to give me an explanation, you know, whatever that might mean. Um, well, it can't be that you just show me the weights on the neural network or even the features that were most important. Here's another thing you could have done. Um, in parallel with the neural network on the side, you could have a nearest neighbor system. And it could be just as good as the neural network. You know, a, a nearest neighbor that takes 50 neighbors uh, and maybe the neighbors are kind of around the contours of the neural nets. Uh, it's smoothing the surface locally, just like a neural net does. And I bet you the prediction will be just about the same. You may lose a little accuracy, optimality, if you will, but it's probably gonna be pretty good prediction, okay? Why then would we use nearest neighbors in real life? Well, because it's way too slow at, at runtime to do this. You have to find the nearest 50 nearest neighbors. That's extremely costly computationally. So we prefer neural nets. On the other hand, for this auditing purpose, you might say, okay, give me a moment. I'll run the 50 nearest neighbors. And then I return the nearest neighbors to the, to the human. They look at the 50 neighbors, they say, oh, I see that person was just like me, except they differed on this certain feature. That helps me understand why I was denied, whereas that person got the loan. Uh, and I reason, again, reasoning is important here, through the looking at those kind of case-based kind of things. Uh, so that part of blend of the toolbox, even cases and examples can play a role here. We don't wanna think about it just as a big pipeline we built, it has the highest accuracy, it's optimal, it's a neural net and we're done. We can have systems in parallel that help handle these other things. And in, ideally we quantify that we lost a little accuracy, but I don't even actually think we would. I think we just got a little slower, but that's what we, we need for the auditing purposes. So again, I didn't answer all of your question there, but I just hope you get a little of the flavor. Again, I don't think this is an you know, like obvious answer, it's done, but you know, I think it's a few, over a few years, it'll start to be best practices will emerge. So uh, given that we hit uh, the top of the hour and we lost 50% of our audience already, I just wanted to take the opportunity to uh, thank uh, Professor Michael Jordan for a uh, most uh, informative, interesting, and thought-provoking uh, presentation. I look forward to the definition of that new field, although I may have some additional areas I would like to include in it. But thank you very much, uh, Mike, and uh, hopefully we can reach you offline and address some of these other questions and figure out how to uh, uh, publish them. Uh, and as always, most of the views will happen of the recorded session. So we'll, we'll make sure that's also available. Thank you very much for joining us. And right. see you all December 7th with uh, Christo Wilson's talk. All Thanks. Right. Th thank you again for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.